Hi, my name is Jade and I'm a medical student in Leicester. In this video, we will talk about fits, faints and funny turns. There are several differential diagnoses for these symptoms and we will go into a few today. We will also go through some clinical cases at the end to test your knowledge. Let's start with faints. Faints can either be syncopal, that is due to cerebral hypoperfusion, or non-syncopal. Syncopal faints can be caused by orthostatic hypotension, dehydration, autonomic dysfunction, structural heart defects, a TIA, vasovagal attacks, or conduction problems within the heart. Non-syncopal faints can be neurogenic, like seizures, or due to metabolic causes like hypoxia and hypoglycemia. Now let's move on to fits. What is a seizure? A seizure is a sudden intermittent burst of abnormal electrical activity within the brain. Seizures tend to be associated with epilepsy, but in fact, they can be caused by many other things, such as stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, medications lowering the seizure threshold, hypoglycemia, hypoxia, meningitis, a brain neoplasm, or even a structural abnormality. Seizures can be focal, which is a type of seizure that begins on one side of the brain and patients either retain consciousness or have impaired consciousness, or they can be generalized, where both sides of the brain are affected and consciousness is not lost. Symptoms of a seizure vary depending on the subtype and part of the brain affected. Some symptoms include tongue biting, urinary incontinence, a post-ictal phase where patients feel drowsy and tired after the seizure, automatisms like lip smacking and hallucinations in focal seizures affecting the temporal lobe, head or leg movements, post-ictal weakness and a Jacksonian march in focal seizures affecting the frontal lobe, paresthesias in focal seizures affecting the parietal lobe, and visual disturbances like floaters and flashing lights in seizures affecting the occipital lobe. Seizures are managed using first aid measures in the community. Protect the patient's head, start a timer, and then put them into the recovery position once they finish seizing if they're breathing. If in hospital, first line treatment is buccal midazolam or rectal diazepam. Plus high flow oxygen can also be given via a non-rebreathe mask. Calculate the GCS and call the anaesthetists if the GCS is low, as this can lead to airway compromise and respiratory failure. If the cause of the seizure is unknown, it's necessary to do some investigations to find the cause, such as an ECG, blood glucose, oxygen saturations, bloods like FBCs, Usenes, calcium levels, LFTs. If the patient's pyrexic, then think about blood cultures, an ABG, and potentially a tox screen as well. Also consider doing a CT head if you're uncertain about head injury or if there's clinical suspicion of underlying structural abnormalities. If the seizure does not resolve within five minutes, then start the status epilepticus algorithm. All patients should be seen by an epilepsy specialist following their first non-febrile seizure to ensure early diagnosis and initiation of therapy if appropriate. Where non-epileptic attack disorders are suspected, suitable referrals should be made to psychological or psychiatric services for further investigation and treatment. So, I mentioned status epilepticus. Status epilepticus is defined as a prolonged seizure lasting five minutes or more, or repeated convulsive seizures, that is, three or more in an hour, without regaining consciousness. It's a medical emergency. Call for help and perform an A to E assessment. Secure the airway, provide high flow oxygen and perform an ECG. Also measure blood glucose. Insert two wide ball cannulae, one on each arm. First line treatment is buccal midazolam or rectal diazepam. If IV access is already established, then IV lorazepam can be given as an alternative. If the seizures continue, then seniors may consider intravenous phenobarbital or phenytoin as second line treatment in hospital. Febrile convulsions are convulsions in children between 6 months and 6 years associated with a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius and above in the absence of CNS infection, metabolic imbalance and neurological conditions. They can be classified into three groups. Simple, 
where the patient has had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure up to 15 minutes and not recurring within 24 hours, complex or atypical, where the seizure lasts more than 15 minutes, is focal or recurs within the same febrile illness, and status, where the seizure lasts more than 30 minutes. Febrile convulsions are usually caused by infection, including tonsillitis and otitis media. They usually last less than 15 minutes and are associated with rapid and full neurological recovery. Febrile convulsions are diagnosed clinically. However, it may be useful to measure BMs and do a urine dip as general precautions. Seizures are managed, as mentioned earlier, with first aid measures. If it is the first ever seizure or the seizure lasts more than 15 minutes, presents with focal signs, occurs in a child less than 18 months old, occurs without any apparent cause for infection or it recurs within 24 hours, then arrange for the patient to be admitted to hospital. Antipyretics like paracetamol and ibuprofen should be given. If the seizure lasts for longer than 5 minutes, then provide buccal midazolam. If no clear infective cause has been found, refer to an epilepsy specialist as this may be the first presentation of epilepsy. After the diagnosis has been made, provide the patient, if applicable, and the parent with education and reassurance, including how to manage future seizures, risks of recurrence, how to recognise and reduce fever, how to keep the child safe during a seizure, and to call the ambulance if seizures last more than five minutes. Finally, let's talk about epilepsy. Epilepsy is a condition where there's a tendency for recurrent, unprovoked seizures of electrical origin in the brain. For a diagnosis of epilepsy to be made, there must have been at least two unprovoked episodes 24 hours apart. Usually, epilepsy is idiopathic, although it can be attributed to genetic causes, structural disorders, metabolic disorders and cerebral infections like HIV, TB and cerebral toxoplasmosis. Epilepsy is a clinical diagnosis based on a detailed history from the patient, plus a collateral history if possible. Home video recording and written descriptions of events can be helpful in making the diagnosis. An EEG can demonstrate abnormal electrical activity in the brain. A CT head or MRI of the brain can be useful if there are focal neurological signs to look for structural abnormalities or signs of head injury. Genetic tests to identify known epilepsy syndromes can be helpful if there is clinical suspicion. In adults, blood tests like plasma electrolytes, glucose and calcium can identify potential causes for seizures. So the first step of management of epilepsy once diagnosed is education. The patient and their family and carers should be educated about action and emergency plans, how to recognise a seizure, how to deal with a seizure. They also should be educated about future careers and driving. Patients cannot drive for six months following a seizure and those with established epilepsy must be fit free for 12 months before being able to drive. Patients should also be signposted to support groups like Epilepsy Action and Epilepsy Society. Care of the patient with epilepsy requires an MDT approach, with input from the patient's GP, epilepsy specialist nurse, consultant neurologist, local paediatrician, educational psychologist, physiotherapist and OT. Now let's talk about the medications used for epilepsy. Sodium valproate and lamotrigine are both used for generalised seizures. Carbamazepine, lamotrigine or levetiracetam can be used for complex partial seizures. It's important to remember that monotherapy should be used wherever possible, and sodium valproate must not be used in women and girls of childbearing potential unless alternative treatments are not suitable. Females of childbearing potential should only take valproate if they have a pregnancy prevention program in place. Women of childbearing age should ideally have a copper IUD fitted and also use barrier contraception if sexually active. Valproate is associated with adverse effects like increased appetite, weight gain, alopecia and thrombocytopenia. Carbamazepine is associated with side effects like diplopia, dizziness, ataxia, drowsiness and leukopenia. Phenytoin is associated with dizziness and ataxia, drowsiness, gingival hypertrophy and hirsutism. Women who want to become pregnant should be warned about the increased risk of the baby having birth defects. They should be advised to take folic acid, 
five milligrams per day well before pregnancy to minimize the risk of neural tube defects. Carbamazepine is considered the safest anti-epileptic to continue during pregnancy. A ketogenic diet, which is a high-fat, low-carb diet, has been found to reduce seizure activity, although the mechanism by which it works is unclear. Surgical intervention can be used in complex or inretractable epilepsy. Vagus nerve stimulation and deep brain stimulation can also be considered in complicated cases with a significant amount of seizure activity. Now let's go through two clinical cases written by my friend Matthew Tucker to test your knowledge so far. So the first case is as follows. A four-year-old girl is brought into the GP surgery by her mother. She recounts that she has been mardy recently and hasn't been eating much. On examination, the child has inflamed purulent tonsils, a temperature of 38.4 degrees Celsius. As they're about to leave, the girl begins convulsing bodily. The attack lasts roughly three minutes and she appears to brighten rapidly after its cessation. What diagnosis is at the top of your list of differentials? The fact that the patient has a history of malaise and clinical signs of infection, as well as the rapid and full neurological recovery, all point to a diagnosis of febrile convulsion. If this is the first time the patient has had a febrile seizure, then remember to arrange immediate hospital assessment by a paediatrician for review. Okay, and now last case, case two. A 68-year-old man has been gardening all day on account of the nice weather. Upon standing to fetch some bulbs, he collapses. His wife phones the on-call GP and the man is conscious and sitting in a chair when the doctor arrives. The man describes feeling dizzy and then everything going black. He has a past medical history of hypertension for which he takes amylodipine, non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus for which he takes metformin, and BPH, which he takes tamsulosin for. What's the most likely cause of the fall? So the fact that this patient collapsed upon standing makes you think about orthostatic hypotension, which is an example of a syncopal faint due to cerebral hypoperfusion. This hypotension is likely due to a combination of dehydration from gardening all day, out in the sun, as well as his antihypertensive medication. Thanks for watching!